What a tragic place to find oneself. A hundred feet from tragedy. And that's where you wake up. That's where you say, okay, hold on a second. Wait, 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 wait. Now I'm ready. That's too late. That's too late now. But there's an even sadder part of that story. That nobody could paint a picture of the roar of the falls way upstream. If you're a leader, isn't that our job? You know, if we're if we're sales managers, isn't isn't our job to to show people what happens if they don't prospect, if they don't set appointments, if they don't communicate? Isn't our job as parents to say, here's what happens if you don't brush our teeth, if you get involved in drugs, if you get involved with the wrong people? Those are the things that we need to do as leaders. And so part of the influence challenge is not only creating the vision of inspiration and here's the possibility, but here's the reality if we don't. It's time to get inside your own head. Begin with the psychology behind your behaviors and fuse it with an acute understanding of self-awareness, emotion, storytelling, body language, and more. Then look at it all through the lens of the latest neuroscience research, broken down to its most digestible form. And you've arrived. Enhanced messaging, deeper connection, heightened influence, and a greater impact on the world. Welcome to the NeuroSide of Influence and Leadership with Rene Rodriguez. All right, well, welcome to this episode. In this episode, I want to talk about, I think, something we can all relate to, which is why do we make decisions that we regret? That's something I think we can all relate to. I know I, I can. It's like, why in the world would we set out to say we know that this certain path, this certain behavior, this decision, this goal, this way of eating, this exercise, saving money, is a good path for our life and our future. And why in the world would we set out in anything opposite of that? And so what is it about that? This sense of we know what to do and why don't we do it? Regret. That's probably the outcome. We'll talk about regret at the end. But I want to talk about why wouldn't we do what we know? And making decisions. And so that, there's a whole... I think a lot of conversation philosophy that has to go around that, around that. But I think the science is fascinating. We can get into all sorts of things, but I want to get into the conversation because I think the more we talk about it, and then we get into a tool at the end of this because I think there's a tool that's really cool, and actually a tool that I think you all know. Yeah, pretty simple. So why do we make decisions that we regret? And I think it comes down to this concept. I want you to think about this, and this is where it kind of helped me is that you really have to think you have two brains inside of you, two selves, if you will. There's a current self and there's a future self, right? There's a, a current self that says, here's what I want to do. And that current self is thinking to the future. It's taking a look at current scenarios of health, financial well-being, relationships, and maybe it's inspired by something. If you've ever been to a workshop where you're looking to the future and you set a goal to the future. And it's saying, this is what I aspire to be based on whatever it is. And that current self sets a pathway to know this is what I want to do. And then the future self, though, is different. It's thinking very differently. Right? Current self may say, I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. But the future self at 5 a.m. in the future might be tired, may have less motivation, may have more excuses at ready at the hand. And that battle of the current and future self is a real one. And in fact, it's not a new discussion. As you, if you know me, you know that I love talking about Aristotle. And Aristotle talked about it. it, it he calls it this concept of acrasia. Acrasia. Google it. It's actually kind of fascinating. Acrasia. I want to make sure I read the definition because there's an actual really cool definition of it. it really, acrasia what he's talking about is called lacking command or weakness. <laughs> when I looked at that, I, I, I was like, ooh, I didn't like that. Lacking command. I don't have command over myself. Is really, and there's a weakness. And acrasia, lack of self-control or that state of acting against one's better judgment. Being acratic. So acrasia. Think about that. Let that kind of sink in a little bit. 
I want to, and I, I like to think of myself as somebody who has self-control over a lot of aspects of my life. But I can also think of a lot of aspects of my life that I don't. This goes back to also our self-awareness topic. If you haven't listened to that podcast, go back to self-awareness. A lot of these things, I think, go and weave into each other. This is self-awareness around, around emotional intelligence, but acrasia, the why we make decisions we regret. So that battle of the current and future self, what's going on? Like, like what's happening? So let's talk about this present and future in the context of the brain. And Daniel Kahneman wrote a great book. He's a behavior, behavioral economist and actually won a Nobel Prize for his work on the brain. And here's what I think is cool about behavioral econ economics. When I first got into this 20 plus years ago, it was like pulling teeth to try to figure out the connection between any sort of business case and emotions and behavior. People were, it, it was, you know, it was like, oh, those are soft skills. That's the touchy feely stuff. And you had to really, really make a case for it. And now we're talking about behavioral economics. And so they're looking at the science behind how people make decisions around money. And so when you're starting to look, make decisions around money and looking at the science behind that, so now when you're starting to look at decisions around money and the science, people pay attention. So the whole economic, so e economics was founded around this concept of people make rational buying decisions, right? So that's the whole study around that. But we all know the reality that we don't make rational buying decisions. We're supposed to buy low and we're supposed to sell high. And that's so simple, right? That's my current self saying that. Hey, let's go buy low and let's sell high. And so then I go to the stock market, I go to whatever app or whoever it is to go buy, and I look at something low and immediately I'm overwhelmed with, oh my God, am I going to lose money because it's going down? Why would I buy something that's going down? That seems like a losing bet. There's the emotion that's involved in that. And then all of a sudden, the fear of maybe being part of a sinking ship. It's like, hey, put money in a sinking ship. I, my whole body is in my brain and everything that I'm designed for is designed to go against that idea. And so then, concept would be by then to sell high. But what ends up happening? I'm looking at something and I see it online and we see everything's going well. And we see it doing well. It's like, wow, everything's going good. I want to be part of this something that's successful. So I'll buy this, which is now high. And then it doesn't do real well, and everyone's selling, and I'm like, well, I should probably let go of this thing that isn't doing well, so I sell it low. These were all the emotional patterns of this. And so they started studying that. And it goes back to acrasia. It goes back to the two battles of the two people inside our head, if you will, two brains that are functioning, or the systems, system one and system two. And he wrote this whole book around that. And it's about one brain that thinks very fast, and another brain that thinks slow. System one and system two. And it's fascinating. So system one is around functioning our autonomic nervous system. It's the automatic functions, the things we don't think about. They're on automatic pilot. So the way we walk, our gait, I mean, right? if we have a, sh a, a hitch in our, our walk, if we are moving our hands, our unconscious body language, our breathing, our heart rate, our digestion, the things that we don't do, if you see someone's facial expression and you know that they're angry or happy or joyful or sad or scared, you immediately know. You don't have to study that information. And so it's picking up all sorts of things that don't take effort or energy. It's critical for our, our, our survival in the world. It's critical for how we function because if we had to put effort and energy in everything, think I'm going to take one step and now I'm going to take another step and, and another step and make sure that my right hand is off balance to my right left hand, left foot and then all of a sudden look to my right and make sure no car is left. But, oh, I forgot to take a step. And so if we had to really be conscious about all of those things, we couldn't walk around. Think about if you play a sport, the unconscious effort you put in after practice and the ability to just play. You're on automatic pilot. That's a system one response. And so system one also has the function to take in very little information and make a lot of quick snap judgments to that. And that's important. If we're walking down a street and you see a shady character come by or coming up to you or maybe, maybe coming in your direction 
within 100 feet, 75 feet. And your system one is designed to put a lot of pieces together to say maybe you should go in a direct, different direction. And so you cross the street. Now, is that fair? Maybe not. Probably not. But your system one doesn't care. I was in Las Vegas several years ago with my two boys. And we had came, come out of a store. And if you know anything about Las Vegas, Las Vegas has some great views. And, and in some places, you come out of a store. I was getting a suit, and we had just got it tailored. And we came out, and there was a nice view of the strip. And so we pulled over to this chain link fence to get out and take some pictures. It was right around uh, sunset, so it was getting dark. And you also know that Vegas has these odd places that there's a chain link fence, there's a store, and then all of a sudden on the other side of the chain link fence is really nothing. And maybe a railroad, but just nothing and maybe some uh, trash bins or, or dumpsters. And that was one of those areas. Didn't think it was that bad. And all of a sudden, some guy comes from around the trash bin or the dumpster holding a bag of popcorn and says, hey, that's all he said. I looked at my two kids and I said, boys, car now. And they immediately got in the car and we drove away. Now, I'm 6'3", 270 pounds. I know how to handle myself. But my system one immediately put together possibilities scenarios that this maybe wasn't a good scenario this wasn't a good place to be didn't know who he was didn't care maybe he was offering popcorn or selling free popcorn maybe he had a discount to the store i was in i don't know but my system one didn't care is that the right thing to do probably not i should maybe i should have been more polite but that's the whole point is your system one is not designed for that it's also designed for survival right the automatic need to survive and live another day. So it's very critical. But now, it's not di designed for accuracy always. So oftentimes it's wrong. And so I'll give you an example. So in your mind, just answer this question. How many of each animal did Moses bring on the ark? And so hold that answer. Think about it. It's a question that it's, we've been asked you know, since we were kids. And so you know, very simple. You knew immediately the answer. But... What's unfortunate is for most of you listening to this, you answered incorrectly. And of course, you're thinking, if you did answer incorrectly, if I were to argue with you to tell you that your answer of two is incorrect, you're thinking, no, it is two. I'm going to tell you, no, it's not two. Now, if you heard what I said, you're probably thinking, okay, that's stupid. But if you're probably, if you're listening to something in the car, or maybe try asking this question, you'll get an answer of two. And then try to tell them that they're wrong, and you'll see how they dig in. That's their system one digging in. And if you think the answer's two, and I'm telling you, or maybe I'm just messing with you. Maybe I'm playing a little trick with you. I've been known to do that. In fact, I love doing that. But the answer isn't two, because it was Noah, not Moses. And so what happened there? They call it a semantic illusion, or the Moses illusion. It's very common. They write about it because of how system one works. Your brain listens to context. It listens to all of the things that are surrounding it and makes very snap judgments, quick judgments, so it doesn't have to think. It's why we read. We don't put every letter together and every sound. We just read. And so we also listen to the context. Moses, Noah, two old men with beards and from a long time ago, ark, animals, just, yeah, two. That was the question, so we answered it quickly. Those are There's a lot of examples of semantic illusions, but... There's a lot of examples of illusions in, in statistics. There's a lot of examples of, you know, there was one that we had, you know, our, our brain isn't designed to calculate. And I'll see if I can find it here as I'm, as I'm doing this. Because there was one last night that I had looked up of, you know, the, the, we, we think we're calculating these things correctly and we're not. Okay, here's another one that kind of triggers our system one. It's kind of funny. Somebody wrote online. They were angry, too. They were serious. They said, Elon Musk has over $152 billion. The population of the Earth is around 7 billion people. He could give every person a billion dollars, and he would still have $145 billion left, but he refuses. This is what capitalist greed looks like. I mean, literally, $152 billion, and if he just gave everybody, I mean, that's a size of a, I mean, when you think about how much $152 billion is, you realize like how much he could share. But now, what's the problem with that? 
And I shared that with people last night. I share it with people all the time. People that are smart, financial advisors, people that are really good with money. And they go, yeah, but that's his money. And you know, they'll defend it. I'm like, no, did you get what I'm saying? And they go, yeah, no, no, I get it. And I'm like, no, but I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? That's like, well, it's his money. He can do what he wants. I'm like, he can't give them all a billion dollars. He can give them a dollar, maybe a couple dollars, but he's not going to have that money left over. He gives away everybody $7 billion. He can give them a dollar and he'll have that left over. He's not going to give everybody $7 billion. He'd have to multiply 7 billion times 7 billion. So think about it. All right. So even my math might be off. I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> Point being, our system one works funny. And we have to really think about that because that's also what's dictating those relationships and those, those, those thought processes and why we make decisions in the current that we regret later. You know, I was, I was doing a keynote last week when I was in Pennsylvania. And I was sharing this concept to a group of business owners and they asked for an example. And I said, well, okay. I said, last night I was in their, uh, their uh, alumni because it, it was at a university. And I was in the alumni house. And I got there. And that previous night I said, I'm just going to go home, get to that place, and I'm going to go to bed. I'm not going to eat anything, right? Because I'm trying to get away from any late night snacks. Because Lord knows a lot of, I like late night snacks. And especially when you're traveling, because you know what? They're awesome when you travel. <laughs> and so I get there, and about 10 o'clock, I'm writing for the book, and by 10.30, my brain, system one kicks in and says, man, some Cheetos would be great right now. There's that system one, the current self. the Actually, the future self that was different than the current self that said, I'm not going to do the Cheetos, and the battle ensues. And so... All of those things are where we battle when it comes to saying, hey, I'm going to save money. Like, hey, you know, if I, put a, if I put money away, this is great. We've all heard the story of two people saving money. One person at 20 years old puts $200 away for seven years. The other person waits seven years and puts $200 away till he's 65. And the one that put it away for the first seven years when he was 20 had more money in the millions versus the one that waited the seven years. And I heard that when I was 19. I didn't do it. Why? Well, system one, system two. And so, I mean, we can also say mentorship and people around and all that kind of stuff. But that's, that's, you know, when you don't have that, you're left to your own devices. You're left to your own what's around you. And there were things in front of me that were more appealing at the time. And that's what it is. You, you're, the ability to look back, and that's where acrasia comes into play, right? Inability to delay gratification. Now, I was, I was, was tons of parts, tons, a lot of aspects of my life that I am able to delay gratification. And just like a lot of us listening, maybe a lot of you listening, there are parts of your life that you struggle. And I think that's the journey, is where am I good? Where am I struggling? And how do I get past it? So now, let's go to system two. That's the other part. That's the human side of it. That's the slow part. And they call it system two because it takes more energy and it's focused. It actually takes uh, time. So what's 12, four, 12 times 487? I don't know either, but I could figure it out. You could figure it out. Use a calculator. If you're good with, uh, if you still remember how to do math on paper, you could figure that out. And so we could figure it out. That's a human function. And so by that human function, we could figure those two out. So that battle of system one and system two, that current self and that future self, the delay of gratification, we all know is that is the key to success. And so I want to give you uh, one more study. We remember if you haven't seen the marshmallow study, I think I've, I've talked about it in, in another podcast, but they placed little kids four years old at a table. They put a marshmallow in front of them. The research that said, hey, Johnny, this marshmallow, it's all yours. You can have it right now. And of course, if you're four years old, that marshmallow is eye level and appealing as could be. And but the researcher then said, but if you wait, if you wait, and I'm going to go do something for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and if I come back and you didn't eat the marshmallow, I'll give you a second one and you can have two. And of course, there was a whole range. Some kids could wait. Some kids couldn't. 
Some kids cried as they waited. Some kids just grabbed the marshmallow and enjoyed it right there. Some kids had no problem waiting. Some kids took a nibble and put it back. One kid put it in his mouth and then put it back. Some kids licked it. Some kids sat there and stared at it. It was a whole range. But they studied these kids over time. And of course, obviously, the ones that waited were more successful in all measures. So what do we do? Some of us are more predisposed to be better at that. Some of us are more impulsive. For those of us that are more impulsive, we have to have tools. We have to have tools that supersede the emotional moment, the power of the emotion and the power of the impulse in the moment. And so I want to share with you this concept of what's called a commitment device. You have to have a commitment device. And a commitment device is something that you engage in that's going to help you in that moment of weakness, right? In that moment of potential acrasia where you're going to be able to overcome it there. And you're preparing for it, right? You're getting yourself ready for that moment. So a commitment device basically is a technique where someone makes it easier for themselves or we make it easier for ourselves to avoid that, that acrasia. Right, that acting against our own better judgment, especially things like procrastination. And so these commitment devices have two major features. One, we voluntarily adopt their use. So we gotta be voluntary, right? We gotta choose into them. And we tie consequences to follow through failures, right? So it's gotta be a consequence. It's a carrot and a stick, but really this is a stick, okay? And so this is the stick side. I think carrots are great, right? The, the carrot and the stick, meaning the carrot is the, hey, if you do this, then you get this reward. But sometimes the carrot isn't enough. Sometimes the carrot isn't enough. I mean, we do things for pay, but that doesn't always enough. I have come to find out that sometimes I need a stick, and not just a stick, I need a baseball bat. <laughs> I need something pretty significant to remind me that this is important, because here is the reality. There's a baseball bat waiting for you. In fact, there's a hospital bed waiting for us if we get our health in shape. There's the streets waiting for us if you don't get your financial life in order. There's loneliness at night. There's a court waiting for you if you don't get your relationship in order. There's all sorts of baseball bats out there in life waiting for you if you don't get your shit together. That's reality. That's life. And so... Why not create it for yourself now? Jim Rohn, the late and great Jim Rohn, loved the word inevitability. And he said, inevitability, something you can't avoid in life. He said, inevitability is finding yourself 100 feet from Niagara Falls in a boat with no oar and no motor. He said, it's over. But the tragic part of that story, he said, was... What a tragic place to find oneself. A hundred feet from tragedy. And that's where you wake up. That's where you say, okay, hold on a second. Wait, 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 wait. Now I'm ready. That's too late. That's too late now. But there's an even sadder part of that story. That nobody could paint a picture of the roar of the falls way upstream. Why couldn't we hear the roar earlier? Why weren't people around us to paint the picture? If you're a leader, isn't that our job? To paint the picture of the roar of the falls way upstream. I mean, way upstream. You know, if we're, if we're sales managers, isn't, isn't our job to, to show people what happens if they don't prospect, if they don't set appointments, if they don't communicate? Isn't our job as parents to say, here's what happens if you don't brush our teeth, if you get involved in drugs, if you get involved with the wrong people? Those are the things that we need to do as leaders. And so part of the influence challenge is not only creating the vision of inspiration and here's the possibility, but here's the reality if we don't. Painting the picture of the roar. And if you're selling a high-end product or high-ticket item, then we got to be able to paint that picture as well. We gotta be able to paint the picture of what happens if you don't solve this problem. Painting the picture of the roar. So getting a commitment device. Sometimes it's having a workout partner, somebody that you trust and you respect, saying, hey, I'll be there at 5 a.m., 6 a.m., 8 a.m., whatever it is. Sometimes it's making a commitment publicly, 
Social media can make a great place for that. Sometimes, it, you know, I had somebody in one of my sessions that said, ah, those don't work for me. And I said, well, why don't you uh, find somebody in this room, your, your competitor, write him a check for $2,000. If you don't do this, eh, he can cash a check by himself some golf clubs. He said, sure, that's fine. I don't really care about the $2,000. I said, okay. I said, is your integrity important to you? He said, it's everything. I said, great. I said, you're going to write an ad. I, and you're going to give him that money. And he gets to post this ad if you don't do it. And it says, hi, my name is John Smith. And I don't keep my word, which is why you should use him. And he looked at me and he goes, yeah, I don't want to post that ad. I said, now we're talking. And so sometimes you got to find what motivates you. Now, should we always use a stick? No. I'd rather much use carrots. But there's some things in life we got to use a stick. Right? We got to use those commitment devices. We got to look at how do we be smart and self aware to say, if I know that I enter that restaurant without having clear purpose of what I'm going to eat first, I'm going to order bad. If I, if I go into that store, I'm going to buy this. Right? If I wake up without a plan, I'm going to go and, and, and mess my whole day up. So maybe I should plan the night before. If I enter this presentation without some pre-planning and preparation, I'm going to wing it and I'm just not going to take it the best way. If I, if I plan this meeting without, you, you see where I'm going with this? So self-awareness around who you are in certain situations, where you fail and where a courageous tends to sort of creep into your life. Start finding solutions for that and make a plan. So commitment devices, all that great stuff. And as Jim Rohn used to say, now is the time to fix the next 10 years. So you're going to face one of two consequences or one of two pains in life, either that pain of discipline or that pain of regret. And he said, discipline weighs ounces, but regret weighs tons. So thank you for tuning in. If you haven't already, please make sure you download, subscribe, share. And our Amplify events can all be found on meetrene.com or amplifymylife.com. We've got our AmpCon Amplify conference coming up at ampcon.live. Please take a look at that. We are super excited about it. And keep tuning in. Any requests, follow us on social media. See Renee speak. And we look forward to seeing you here every week. Have an amazing day.